methods. He is one of the uh, leading investigators in the identifying interaction mechanisms to improve the quality of police civilian encounters. Thank you for being with us, Jeffrey, and I'll hand the word to you. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, to join you here today. He is today. one of the uh, leading investigators in the identifying interaction mechanism to improve the quality of police civilian encounters. Thank you for being with. Uh, th thank you very much for inviting me today. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm very excited to be part of this panel and a part of this series, uh, which I think is really important. And I'm most excited about the international collaboration that you've organized. Uh, the talk uh, I'm going to give today is beyond the search for passive effects uh, using video technology to improve key outcomes in police encounters. And this is a collaborative project with a number of collaborators, Kristen Prakota and Nikki Jones uh, early on, and now uh, Kevin Whitehead and Brett Bowman. So uh, you can see their um, participation in this. <clears throat> So within the context of US research on policing, uh, most research on body-worn cameras and dash-mounted cameras have been primarily concerned with passive effects. That is with the ways in which cameras can be used to observe and understand policing. So for example, there's an assumption that the presence of a camera in an encounter will shape the conduct of officers and civilians, but research on this has produced really mixed results. So for example, uh, Farrar argued that body-worn cameras have a civilizing effect resulting in improved behavior among both police and officers and police officers and citizens. But the lab at DC in doing a, 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 a larger study found the presence of body-worn cameras had no detectable effect on police discretion. Uh, John, when police or sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I think the slides are not working. Can you uh, reinitiate uh, maybe sure. other, the sharing please? Sorry Thank you that. for letting me know. No, that's, uh, I'm grateful to know. Uh, can you see them now? Yes. Okay, yes. much better. All right, uh, I'm gonna pick up where I left off so we don't get too far behind. Uh, when, when police organizations use uh, a video for training, the focus is also pretty limited. It tends to focus on things like tactical decision-making by the officer or the absence or use of efforts to de-escalate. Sometimes they're also included in analyzing use of force complaints and for civilian oversight. Where, where body-worn cameras, uh, particularly in the U.S. context, uh, have, been used to re have been used for research that seeks to understand police encounters, uh, the focus has been primarily critical, which I, I wholeheartedly endorse, uh, but I want to suggest we can do even more. So, for example, they've been used to identify racial disparities in the use of respectful language. Uh, but I want to suggest that this video data can also be used for research that locates, describes, and evaluates communicative practices, and thereby intrudes into the ways in which police encounters are conducted as they unfold. So uh, this kind of research can focus on addressing social problems associated with policing, for example, encouraging mutual cooperation and trust, reducing the use of coercive violence, uh, and particularly reducing racial disparities and improving community relations. These are all domains where generic advice is likely to be ineffective. Um, uh, for example, the Department of Justice in the United States recommends that officers be respectful and answer questions, which is, you know, fair enough, uh, but it tends to ignore the interactional pressures that leads officers to engage in problematic forms of conduct in the first place. So the UCSB, UC Berkeley effort, which has been funded by various agencies, uh, tries really to do three things. We wanna understand basic aspects of police encounters with the public using video data. Uh, second, we wanna uncover and understand routine or systematic sources of trouble in these encounters and find and describe communicative practices that officers use to manage these troubles and the outcomes they can shape, um, uh, particularly focusing on practices that encourage mutual trust uh, or contribute to policing practices that attend to community concerns uh, rather than policing concerns. And third, we wanna use these to either contribute to a curriculum for training police officers or and or uh, uh, to establish evaluative standards that can be used to uh, assess the conduct of police encounters. The approach we're taking here uh, relies on detailed studies of, of video data. 
Uh, and I'm going to assume that not everyone here knows about uh, the approach I'm taking, so I'm going to take a few minutes to just introduce it. We use a, an approach called conversation analysis, which is a theory of talk and interaction that's been used to, dis to study conversation and interactional uh, institutional interactions for the last 40 years, and now has a large body of robust findings that's been tested on cultures, languages, and institutions around the world. Um, and to kind of exemplify how this approach works, I want to talk about how this method has been applied to communication and medical care, where conversation analysis is now considered the gold standard for studies of doctor-patient interaction in the United States. The approach has led to the discovery and description of practices that shape key outcomes in medical practice and quantitative analyses of their efficacy. And I want to talk about two of these studies. Uh, the first is by Heritage and Robinson, who talk about uh, the problem of soliciting patients' unmet needs. And the problem is this. When patients visit the doctor, they often have more than one problem that they're concerned about, and they often don't report their main medical concern initially. Uh, and so often that results in delayed uh, uh, treatment and the missed work and additional costs associated with that delayed treatment costs about $5 billion a year, uh, it's estimated. So the solution turns out to be fairly simple, simply changing one word in the way that doctors pose the question that ad uh, solicits additional uh, uh, concerns has substantial consequences in the conduct of encounters. So doctors are trained to ask something along the lines of, are there any other concerns you'd like to address or anything else? And it turns out that any uh, has what is, is what's called a negative polarity item and it conveys a negative expectation. Uh, if doctors simply switch to asking, are there some other concerns you'd like to address, which conveys a positive expectation the patient will have something to share. Uh, additionally, changing where that uh, question gets posed following the initial solicitation and following a treatment recommendation. The use of that simple change eliminated more than 75% of unmet concerns. So part of the observation here is sometimes very modest adjustments in institutional practice can have substantial impacts on institutional outcomes. A similar kind of uh, approach uh, is described in Heritage 2009 on the overprescription of antibiotics. The problem here is that doctors prescribe antibiotics for viral infections, and that leads to the development of antibiotic resistant uh, uh, bacteria. The long-term consequences of this, uh, of this are pretty dire and well-known, widely accepted by doctors, and yet doctors continue to prescribe antibiotics for viral infections, even when they know they're being studied for, study for, for prescribing antibiotics for viral infections. Uh, this, in the, in the U.S. context, likely reflects doctors' sensitivity to patients' expectations or demands for prescriptions. So the solution that, uh, that, doctor, uh, that Heritage and his colleagues came up with was to use what they called online commentary during physical exams. Basically, doctors report the absence of observable symptoms, and in doing so, reduce caregiver or patient expectations that the doctor is going to prescribe antibiotics and challenges to or ask questions about whether the doctor is going to prescribe antibiotics. And again, this significantly reduces the likelihood that doctors prescribe antibiotics. I think the challenges with policing are, are profound and pervasive, uh, but I also want to suggest that the solution uh, in part entails adjustments to how they conduct police encounters, and these kinds of adjustments can have substantial impacts. Now, as a methodological caveat, studying police encounters is a very different kind of problem, and conducting police encounters is a really different kind of problem than doctor-patient interaction. These encounters are almost overwhelmingly non-consensual. They're initiated spontaneously and so are often interruptive of whatever the civilian who stopped is trying to do. They may involve multiple parties who are aligned in different ways to the kind of problem the police have been called on to address. The parties involved may be mistrustful, fearful, mistrustful for good reason, fearful, inebriated, mentally ill, uh, and they may entail the use of enforcement fines and arrests that have negative consequences for the persons being stopped. And all of these then are associated with conflicts that emerge by reference to them and shape whether and how police officers come to rely on the use of force uh, or the use of violence in conducting police encounters. 
So we try to address these challenges by using multiple methods and data sources. So we use ethnographic observation and uh, interviews, training, and so on to identify systematic problems and processes in encounters. We then use conversation analysis to develop analyses that link these two basic practices of and for interaction and develop ecologically valid codes for capturing meaningful conduct and its sequential organization for analysis. And then we use quantitative analyses to measure associations between meaningful conduct and institutional outcomes. Uh, and I wanna illustrate how we approach this using uh, a study we did on how officers respond to what they conceive of as resistance. So this paper uh, looks at what we call, or what have been called problem-oriented or investigatory police encounters. This is the kind of standard encounter you think of where a police officer has been called to a setting or seen something where there's a problem uh, emerging. Uh, and these encounters are the ones in which police officers try to get people to do things they might not otherwise do, uh, and are by virtue of that feature, the site where officers are most likely to use coercive violence to try and accomplish their aims. What we found is that what police officers treat as civilian resistance or defiance actually emerges in and as what we call a sequential standoff. Basically in a place where a police officer does or is about to initiate a course of action, say, let's go outside or come over here, sit down, what's your name? A civilian initiates a different competing course of action. My brother, my sister, uh, I'm the one keeping the peace, uh, some other kind of thing. And then each party pursues their own course of action, repeating their requests, command announcements, and so on, and escalating in their pursuit of uptake from others. Um, so uh, what we noticed about these is this is the, the most common place where force gets used, the most common form that conflict emerges encounters, uh, and generic advice to be respectful and answer questions is unlikely to be effective. Let me show you an example of what I mean by this. Uh, in this uh, um, encounter, officers have been called to a racial disturbance inside a convenience store where a person, a woman, has been reported to be uh, using uh, racially offensive language and in a loud fight with uh, uh, someone else in the store. When the police officers arrive, they enter the store and find three civilians. They find a couple composed of a white male, white male and a white female uh, and a black male. As the police officers arrive, their entry projects that they're there to do something, that they've been called and so they're gonna initiate some kind of course of action. But before they can get the first words out, the black male who's inside the store speaks first and attempts to, to preempt treatment of him as a suspect. He's basically assuming that the police are gonna come in uh, and treat him as the suspect in the situation, uh, orienting to his provisional status. Uh, and, and, he, and he turns out to be right. Uh, and he tries to preempt that treatment by saying, uh, honestly, sir, I have no issues. So let me just play this so you can hear what happens and see that by virtue of the conflict that emerges between him and the police officer, he becomes the one subject to the use of force. Could you hear all that? Okay, good. good. Uh, okay. Uh, so in the aftermath of this, uh, you know, they bring him out, they put him on the front uh, of the car, uh, the two, uh, the white couple kind of mill around and he becomes the focus of the police encounter for the next 20 minutes, uh, which is a really sustained conflict. So here's what I want to notice. As the officers enter the store, uh, BM2 makes an announcement. Honestly, sir, I have no issues. He's claiming a status as a by bystander to avoid being treated as a suspect and tries to make addressing that concern a priority. But the police officers direct the parties to go outside before they start discussing who, what happened or who's involved because they know if they start that process, they can reopen the fight. So we have a situation in which for both parties, participating in the other's course of action opens a possible trajectory that their own course of action seeks to avoid. So neither one can participate in the other apparently. Uh, uh, and once 
competing lines of action have been initiated, a contest over what to do next emerges. So civilians often engage in efforts to recruit others, to involve bystanders, to take video, to get others to testify on their behalf, and police officers escalate their pursuit of compliance, often using coercive violence. So what we what we noticed is that civilian resistance rarely takes the form of open defiance of police uh, uh, requests or demands, and instead routinely reflects their involvement in some alternative course of action. So you can see in this case that uh, the officers uh, um, uh, only talk uh, in ways that pursue or advance their own course of action, while the civilians both address the officer's course of action and pursue. The, uh, uh, the, the civilian's course of action. So I've just coded these in, in blue and black and I'll, I'll skip over this uh, kind of quickly. Um, it's at this point down here in line 16, okay, okay, I'm coming outside that the officer resorts to force and the conflict escalates even further. Uh, and as I mentioned, the conflict persists over the next 20 minutes. Uh, and after this encounter, the black male filed a complaint about what happened in it. So when civilians initiate actions like this, the questions, complaints, the offers and announcements that they produce have a different status than the initiating actions that police officers produce. And this is reflected in a range of features of their production and design. They're often produced at a faster pace, a higher volume. They uh, use address terms that orient to the officers as not ready to uh, or not prepared to hear them. Uh, and not surprisingly, their production typically delays or impedes what the police officer is trying to accomplish. And so police officers treat these initiating actions by civilians as challenging, as disruptive or distracting. Uh, but of course, this is how civilians can shape the way these encounters unfold. So you can understand why they continue to pr pursue them. So these are also a, a, a places where each party then pursues a response, uh, often in using escalating methods. Um, but the methods that, that participants use in these kinds of standoffs reflect a basic asymmetry. Police officers recurrently resort to force and coercive violence to pursue the projects they're engaged in, while civilians resort to pleading and recruiting bystanders. So what I wanna look at today is how officers respond to these incipient or actual conflicts and how the alternatives they have shape whether they rely on coercive violence. I'm gonna show you another encounter now. Uh, this is officers called to a, a fight between a brother and a sister outside a bar. Uh, two other family members are present, a brother and a sister as it happens. So there's two brothers, two sisters. Um, and in this case, uh, the two police officers initially intervene to break up the fight and the sister throws a punch and hits the police officer in the face. Uh, so the police officers initiate an arrest of her uh, and you'll hear her crying in the background. Um, and uh, while this is happening, CM1, who you can see circled in red here, is a brother and he is going to uh, try and get to where the site of his sister is being arrested and intervene in the arrest. Uh, and the arriving officer who's behind him, who's female police officer one here, um, runs to assist in the arrest uh, 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 and, and, and specifically to try and peel CM1 off and move him to another location while he attempts to return to his sister's uh, uh, arrest. So here's another sequential standoff uh, and uh, where, where both parties are, are committed to doing something the other course of action tries to preempt. Um, we're going to pick up the video here after FP1 has made several attempts to move CM1 to another location, and this produces the sequential standoff. Each party pursues a course of action the other seeks to avoid, uh, and as we'll see, this uh, encounter has a quite different outcome than the last one that we looked at. So let me play it, and then I'll analyze it a little bit. Okay. Let's go. Over here. Let's go. Get over here. Get over here. Man, I don't man, care. Man. Sit down. Sit down. Until we get this figured out, we have no idea what's going on. You need to stop. Sit down. I'm not doing anything. Sit down. down. My, my sister. On the ground. Okay, and we'll I figure it out. Sit down. I'm, I'm down. No, on your ass against the wall. Sit down my ass. <laughs> okay, I get that. But until we get this figured out, you can't be pastoring everybody. Until someone talks to you, just chill out, okay? I understand. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna try and speak a little slower here. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, um, 
So just to, to kind of recap where we, uh, where we are in this encounter, we, we hear the officer uh, initiate an effort to move the civilian away from the arrest. Uh, the civilian persists in pursuing contact with the arrest uh, and justifying a reason and providing a reason for his return. My other sister, my sister, my brother. Um, we can also see that the female police officer times the pursuits of her own course of interact, uh, so her own course of action to intersect with the turn beginnings of the civilian. So every time the civilian starts to talk, the uh, officer intersects that with a pursuit of her own course of action. Uh, in that respect, she's treating the civilian's course of action as a, a form of resistance to her own course of action, just as in the last encounter. But we can also see a really important difference in this encounter, and that is that the officer both addresses the civilian's actions and pursues her own course of action. So she, uh, uh, she, she, for example, justifies not attending to the civilian until we get this figured out. We have no idea what's going on. You just need to stop. That's lines 29 to 32. And it's these uh, uh, acknowledgments of what the civilian try, is trying to do that seems to be the turning point in the encounter. What had been an unsuccessful attempt to get him to not participate in the encounter uh, emerges as a successful attempt to get him to move once she starts to attend to what he is uh, uh, also trying to do. So in various places, she acknowledges the civilians initiating action. Uh, okay, we'll figure this out in a bit, she says in line 41. Uh, and crucially, in these acknowledgments, she proposes a sequential solution to their conflicting actions. So in the last case, it was abandoned one course of action to do another. Here, she's proposing first we do mine, then we do yours. Uh, this is a very different kind of way of managing this trouble. And it's a, it, it produces a really different standoff. The parties achieve a stable resolution of this. Um, so first, the civilian begins to cooperate. Um, the police officer then produces a complex turn that registers and claims understanding of what the civilian's trying to do, accounts for not doing it now, and then proposes a basis for resuming it later. And we get a, an acceptance of this as an outcome and no more trouble from this civilian. So the civilian here uh, suspends a project that he wouldn't otherwise abandon. So we wanted it, we were interested, is this systematic? Could we find whether or not this really is a, a way of managing this basic problem that happens in so many police encounters? And there are basically two options. Police officers can respond to or acknowledge civilian initiating actions, or as they're trained to do, they can continue to pursue their own actions and thereby ignore sequentially delete or suppress what the civilians are trying to do. Um, just to give you some examples of how we coded this, uh, these are examples of police officers responding to or acknowledging civilian initiating actions. They're coded in blue here. Um, and in all of these cases, um, where there's a conflicting agenda, the, the, the police officer proposes or provides a sequential solution to that, first one, then the other, and in that way organizes the, the encounter in terms of mutual accommodation. More commonly, however, officers simply suppress or reject what, off, uh, what the civilians are trying to do. Uh, so they use various methods to pursue uh, their own course of action and, and pursue compliance with the civilian, uh, by the civilian, um, thereby enhancing institutional asymmetry and emphasizing control and unilateral organization over mutual accommodation. Uh, and in that way, they treat the civilian's concern and agenda as immaterial or hostile or problematic. So we developed a hypothesis. We developed a number of hypotheses. I'm going to talk about two uh, that it's better to acknowledge civilians than to sequentially su uh, suppress them. So uh, the two I want to talk about are that civilians are more likely to cooperate with an officer's next directive if the civilian has been acknowledged, uh, and that there's a higher likelihood the encounter will be conducted cooperatively. That is without the use of uh, force or coercive violence. So the first of these. Uh, it involves 
looking at how likely civilians are to cooperate with the next thing a police officer asks them to do after a civilian has initiated an action. So what we did is we, we said when a police officer either acknowledges or suppresses a civilian's initiating action and then issues a directive within the next 15 seconds, does the civilian cooperate or does the police officer pursue compliance or use force to physically compel compliance? So here we're trying to find a tight coupling between whether police officers acknowledge civilians and whether civilians are likely to cooperate. And what we found uh, is that if a police officer acknowledges a civilian's initiating action, the odds that the civilian will cooperate with the next directive increases by 10 times. It's a really massive uh, uh, impact. Uh, just this small adjustment has a really substantial impact on whether civilians are likely to cooperate. But we also wanted to know, does this reduce the use of force or coercive violence? And here we created a binary variable that distinguish between encounters where there's two or fewer suppressions, like in that uh, encounter that I showed you outside the bar with the family fighting, or where there's three or more suppressions like uh, happened in the 7-Eleven, uh, uh, the, the convenience store case. Uh, and we then created uh, an estimate of the probability of cooperative completion using a logistic regression. Uh, and what we found is that the odds of a cooperatively achieved outcome increases by 20 times if there's no suppression. That is, if police officers are not sequentially deleting and ignoring what civilians say, the, the odds that they will not use violence increases by 20 times. So this suggests that police officers face a choice in how they respond to these kinds of conflicts and other chaotic situations. And our findings suggest that even a modest adjustment in the way police officers uh, respond to civilians can have a large impact on institutional outcomes. And I just wanted to say, I think there's a lot that, that needs to be done beyond this, but I think it points to how uh, available a different kind of policing uh, really is. So responding to civilian initiating actions and proposing sequential solutions is highly effective in reducing police violence. By contrast, the practices that are currently advanced in training in the United States, which emphasize control over cooperation, actually reduce the sequential options within the encounter and make the use of coercive violence by police more likely. So in conclusion, the use of body-worn cameras and dash-mounted cameras for video, uh, for, for training and oversight, I think are really important. There's a lot we can do with that. But I think both of those uh, uses can be enhanced if we conduct video research that intrudes into the ways police conduct encounters and engage in policing. This data can be used as the basis for research that contributes significant insights into how police encounters with the public unfold and it provides a baseline for how routine police encounters are conducted, as well as how they vary or come to be altered and extended. In a recent paper, Jones and I and others look at how police manage encounters in different neighborhoods and the logic they use um, to, to illustrate this. Um, it can also be used to provide meaningful advice regarding communicative practices that address routine or systematic sources of trouble, as I just tried to illustrate. Um, I think it's really important for this kind of research uh, to emphasize reducing police officers' reliance on violence as a means of social control and promoting the use of alternative communicative practices that make policing more responsive to the concerns of subjects of police encounters and the communities to which they belong. Thank you very much. Muito obrigado. I hope I... Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, it, yeah, well, it was a pleasure listening to you and being here with you today. So it's fascinating, the research. I already have a couple of questions here for you, but let's wait uh, so that we go through the, we go to the final debate and just to, just to remember that uh, if you're following on YouTube, you can also ask questions through the chat on YouTube. And uh, now let's go to our second uh, guest, uh, Amanda Velasco. Uh, she's a doctor in uh, language studies by PUC-Rio. 
and uh, her research is focused on studies of uh, speaking and interaction and uh, and uh, and also police uh, interaction. So it has a lot of dialogue with Jeff's presentation that we just here. Amanda, thank you so much for uh, being here, and then you have the you have the floor. Vocês me ouvem bem? Vem já a minha tela? Ok. Um, All right, uh, you, good afternoon. So it's an honor to be uh, in this event here today, uh, listening to colleagues and also, and I hope that we can uh, also contribute to the work that I, by contributing with this work that I, that I am doing together with uh, Maria do Carmo Oliveira from a book here about uh, police violence and also surveillance in Brazil. And uh, as that we can see here in these images, Today in our society, there are many layers of surveillance, and uh, and the police context is not an exception. So, for us to understand better this Brazilian scenario, it is important to have in mind that Brazil is a country that is uh, they highlights by the no by high number of uh, police of police deaths. At the same time, as it's also with abusive use of the force, so we have a, a police model that is very uh, suppressing, and also the, the the decision who to approach is already considered by literature it has already been uh, shown in literature as a decision very subjective. The literature of uh, social science uh, highlights that uh, there is a profile of a suspect that generally is the target of these uh, of these freaks, uh, blacks, uh, poor, from uh, low-income communities and related to low-income communities such as uh, Islam, that in these places are uh, workers and criminals, uh, traffic uh, dealers, so they, uh, they share the same space and they must be different. And this distinction not always happens in, in this meeting, in these encounters with the police. And that's where we have this uh, uh, a crisis of uh, trust in this context. The policeman uh, interprets the action of the as, a, as an act of disobedience, of resistance, and uh, and a low level of co of cooperation and the response with this using of a high level of force. Uh, the question is that in these cases, the policeman uh, always says that there is a disobedience and uh, the, the penal code in Brazil does not define very clearly what is this type of disobedience. And uh, not always the, the citizen uh, uh, agrees with this and, uh, and with the level of uh, force that is being used. In this case, we see that... Uh, in, in, there is a, a counter surveillance, which is to serve to make the surveillance of those who they always uh, are looking at, especially due to this lack of uh, trust in the police, in the institution. So nowadays in the internet, there are several videos that shows that uh, uh, practices that are considered abusive by the population, and we have studied uh, this this material, uh, audiovisual material. In these videos, we have realized that there is a search for a, uh, a, a evidence, material evidence of guilt, may be used in a, in a court, as there is a, a high level of uh, impunity in the Brazilian society or the institution through the social medias for. Uh, um, in front of a public who can become, you know, uh, a public jury of a uh, of massive amount. So we use as a base in this analysis, these videos, the studies on the police in these Brazilian incidents and uh, and, and multi-model incidents of uh, with interaction in, in speech. So there are videos that show the police in action, uh, especially in communities or slums. Uh, Third-party videos uh, that show and also uh, claim that the police violence, and also they, they show you know uh, the on uh, flagrant. On uh, there is also a, a understanding of guilt that something is out of control, and that in this case uh, the video that we we analyzed that we will show here today is a video that was done in Rio de Janeiro, was filmed in Rio de Janeiro in a low-income community, and it was shared on YouTube in 2013 uh, to, to showing, uh, showing two uh, application of uh, 
ostentative uh, of uh, of uh, using uh, of uh, a, a headrest, uh, a backstroke to, with uh, a police officers. And here we have three policemen in the scene. One citizen that was uh, that was uh, now uh, freaked and then taken to the police station in an amateur uh, film taker who was also. Uh, uh, approached by the police, but uh, but his colleague was taken to the police station, and and, and he in his case uh, records of what he is uh, witnessing, and uh, we were the we were told that the this the João who was taken to the police station he was not carrying weapons or drugs, but uh, he. Uh, but he was uh, categorized as an act of uh, of uh, contempt, and in this situation, and when the use of force increases, the cameraman, the the the, the filmmaker, the amateur filmmaker, makes kind of a headline, which because he says as uh, the policeman, you know, uh, uh, using the force against a police against a, a citizen who just arrived back from work. So we're going to see here. Uh, Renan, who appears since the beginning of the video, using you know, a fictitious name, and we also will see since the beginning of the scene, João, who is uh, taken to, to the police station, and then we're going to listen to the voice of Vitor, uh, who, and uh, please let's uh, play the video. Okay, let's go downtown. I'll take you downtown. Against the wall. Hey, take it easy, bro. Take it easy, man. Okay, police officer assaulting a resident who has just arrived from work. Against the wall. Hey, call Rita. Call Rita, please. Come on, man. I'm a black belt. Lewis. He's a resident here. Hey, this is not how it works, man. Come on. Take it easy on him. What's up? What's up, man? What's going on? Come on, dude. What's up with you? What's, what's wrong with you, man? Hey. Have you found any stash on him? Why are you treating him like that? All he did was pick up his phone from his pocket. Okay, it's contempt. Take note. Contempt. Come on. You mobilized him immediately when you saw him. Give me your hand. Give me your hand. Take it easy, man. Come on. Okay, why are you assaulting me, man? Okay, you're not going to give me your hand? Come on, help me out. Somebody help me out here. Okay. We came out of the alley. We just came out of the alley, and he told us uh, to put our hands against the wall. He just reached for his phone in his pocket, and then he was assaulted. Come on, let me go, man. I've done nothing wrong. What's your name? Take it easy, man. You're hurting me. Come on. I'm a worker. You you resisted arrest, man. Come on, man. You're hurting me. You're hurting me, man. Hey. It's my phone ringing. I'm just going to I'm just going to follow you guys here. Hey, man. You're hurting me. Come on. Take it easy on me. Hold on, hold on. I'm busy here right now, man. Take it easy. Take it easy. For real. Come on. You, you don't have to treat me like that. Come on. I've done nothing wrong, man. What's going on, dude? 
Yeah. Hey, did he swear at you? He did not swear at you, right? Yeah. I'm shooting the video here. Yeah, he has not. He's not called your names. All he did was reach for his phone in his pocket. That's all he's done. Just reach for his phone, man. That's it. Hey, come on. Let him call somebody to follow him downtown. Hey, can you hear me again? Thanks. All right. So we've noticed here that in, in the beginning of this interaction, once it starts being... Uh, video right so the police officer uh says okay let's go downtown and uh civilian right he refuses the order he said come on I'm not going but it's not only refusing the order he also uh offers a challenge because he didn't say i'm not going he says don't go you know and this challenge is followed by a series of ch uh challenges uh from the police officer we're going to see on line three where he says what are you what are you not going to do and then right after that, throughout various lines, you can see here, he repeats on line seven, then line 11, you won't what? And then he starts uh, uh, trying uh, uh, a back choke, a neck choke, right? Already using force at a, using greater force actually. And then we'll see that the civilian, right, who is, Stopped by the police officer. He says, come on, take it easy, take it easy, man. And even asks uh, a third per party to be called. Call Rita, please. And then we see here in line eight that another police officer, Roberto, he says, his, he asks his, his colleague, hey, take it easy, man. Take it easy, Renan. So there's a, a general understanding that things are out of control. There's a greater use of force being used on behalf of the police officer. And we see this in these uh, images right here. And image four, we can see pretty well how the police officer starts to, uh, he starts a, a, a neck choke and how the civilian will try to escape that choke. And it's important to keep in mind that according to the documents, the police files, uh, the maximum use of force is the one that puts at risk uh, the life of civilians. And this level of, of force could only be uh, applied by the police officer when he himself suffers in, uh, an aggression, a lethal aggression. And uh, the neck choke, which is a type of choke, can actually choke and kill a person. So we've seen that the uh, level of force already almost to the maximum. And we can see here that uh, the civilian uh, shooting the video who was following his uh, friend, he tries to intervene uh, as some kind of headline on line 17. Victor says, police officer assaulting resident when he has just arrived from his work. So he categorizes his friend as a worker, uh, making this distinction that I mentioned before that is not always uh, observed in a police uh, approach approach he categorizes the man as a police officer uh, excuse me as a worker and categorizes the police action as an aggression so we'll see later that the police officer says you're gonna do what well he's gonna yeah he's gonna throw me on the ground and then he turns to the camera and we can see this in uh image number seven so he he already uh, uh calls attention to this situation and he will try to categorize his action as legitimate and not as some uh, against somebody who's aggressive and suspicion and who challenges. And right after that, we can see that the police officer uh, continues challenging the uh, the, uh, the uh, civilian. Come on, come on, keep trying, man. Keep trying. Try your chances. So this interaction uh, has verbal uh, defiances uh, on behalf of the citizen as well. But there's a difference. This citizen in this case. We cannot hear it because of the quality of the audio. It's an amateur video, but we couldn't hear if he was, in fact, he, in fact, um, made a threat or not. But it, what matters here to us is that the police officer is uh, moving towards 
that direction. And he, but in other moments in the video, we can also see that he, in fact, does threaten, right? But he, he makes threats, he def defies, he refuses uh, uh, the police order. But these are verbal actions. While the police uses force and and great the maximum use of force. And when once again he tries to uh, use a pack choke, a neck choke, which is so intense that uh, the civilian Joel he cannot speak anymore. He tries to speak and but he can't because of the way he's been um, already choked. As, so we can also see that. Uh, this interaction, this is uh, it's it's a sexist culture, right? That has been already appointed by the literature of uh, social sciences in Brazil. But we can also see this in practice, and the analysis of this video. And I have brought here, uh, I mentioned here how this becomes so explicit, right? In line, excerpt two, Joan says, "Come on, man, take it easy on me." And then the other says, "Relax, man, let's go." But let's let's see. And then the police officer says, "Okay, but let's see if you're a man." So there's this uh, uh, orientation on behalf of the police officer that would not be against uh, only a resistance, you know, or a threat, but or a uh, contempt. But there's also an offense in the legal uh, realm. There's the matter of the contempt. There could be the matter of contempt, but in the personal uh, matter, there's also this offense to a man and just uh, like who is more uh, who is more macho in this in relationship. And so we've seen in this video many matters uh, in a brief manner, but I'd like to summarize it in this presentation that uh, there's uh, an escalation of, of violence which contradicts uh, police norms. And we've seen that this police officer, he follows this uh, culture of masculinity and he takes part in this dispute with a civilian of who is the biggest man in this uh, uh, encounter. And then the counter surveillance, it erases the barriers between the place, the private matter and the projected place, which is distant to the to the audience in a way that at the same time, the police officers are uh, conducting or arresting uh, 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 a possible suspect and taking him downtown. But they're always like uh, uh, being oriented to, towards this audience that is projected which is anonymous and heterogeneous, but with a uh, massive potential, as I've mentioned before. So we're, we're going to have this dispute here, explicit by the truth of the facts, which is a, a, a possibility offered by new technologies of communication, of uh, recording images to allow the audience to decide for themselves what is the truth. And if there, there is a, a truth version of the facts, it's interesting to realize that there's uh, historically the literature, Brazilian literature uh, shows uh, moral cleansing on behalf of the citizens. The citizen must before make this effort and differentiate himself from the criminal that shares a space with him in his own community in the favelas. But what we've seen here, there's an inversion of this work of uh, moral cleansing because the police officer is positioned as somebody who has to explain his actions to this uh, possible audience. And uh, finally, I'd like to point out that uh, this potential of uh, video analysis of the uh, multimodal conversation analysis, but in a general way, mostly the analysis of video to better understand the actions that occur in uh, the encounter between police officers and civilians. And finally, also emphasize uh, the potential of such analysis not only for us researchers uh, to reach this comprehension, this understanding, but also and mainly for the police officers to be trained and they can reflect upon their own practices. So these practices become uh, less impulsive and gradually uh, more reflective and less violent and more uh, p peaceful. Thank you. So, Amanda, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, it was really interesting to see this in this opportunity and contrast to the type of material that you analyze with what uh, what we saw previously with Jeff's presentation. And uh, also, uh, right after uh, the, the next presentation, maybe make some comments and talk about this uh, contrast. 
So uh, therefore, let's go on to our third uh, and last uh, uh, presenter. Vicente, he is uh, from uh, Juiz de Fora uh, Federal University, and he has experience in the area of the sociology of, uh, of law. So just as, as uh, public safety media, uh, besides uh, working as a researcher and a, and a professor, he is also a consultant in uh, together with the Ministry of Justice, uh, Ministry of Education, and uh, the Depart uh, the Rio de Janeiro Department of Public Safety. So Vicente, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, to have you here with us, and you have the floor. So thank you so much, Fabio. Thank you so much for the colleagues for the invitation. I have worked uh, also as a consultant uh, so by, for these institutions, and also I have experience in the development of uh, programs of uh, you know uh, postgraduate studies for uh, police officers in several states in Brazil. You know what the theme that I will present today that I will work on it is uh, it's a result of a research that we started here in Juiz de Fora University in the year 2013, and uh, in the beginning of this research uh, was exactly. Uh, the, the, an attempt to understand how the legal system, uh, as how the judge would uh, would realize the use of the video as a, as a means of a witness or uh, evidence. I'm sorry, uh, and, and how would the, this judge and how this uh, uh, jurists would use the e image as uh, evidence, uh, especially uh, concerning the fact that uh, the capacity to uh, to film images and uh, and also to and constantly the the image starts to be used ever more as a means of uh, evidence in court. So uh, we're going to work on. Uh, uh, the use of video in and we use a have data in brazil uh, in, in much of the literature is a literature uh is a is a english literature and then it's built on the basis that it has the characteristic the the anglo-saxon legal system and here in brazil we have uh we have the civil law roman uh, type of law which are codes that structure the legal the legal procedures and the police procedures uh, you can move on in the presentation and uh, the legal and the legal procedures they are uh, they are worked basically by means of the written word so if we observe the procedures in terms of uh, of uh, uh, not all the crimes are are judged by the by the by the judges uh, only those that I had that present a risk of an attempt of life. So the jury in our system uh, has a, a very small uh, breach in, uh, in the other types of system. It's built around the judge and, and uh, there's a whole strategy to, to, to argument against this, the trial as a theater, for example. So the process, as you know, as a as a theater, and so everything is very well built in uh, towards this point. In our case, uh, this uh, doesn't uh, exist. Uh, so, so if we observe the presence of the video, it will increase, you know, uh, greatly uh, in uh, in uh, in countries that have a terrestrial system or civil law system, and. Uh, and then we have, uh, we think, okay, how can we understand this? So there are some uh, problems that came up that we started to work on with the, as the image established, you know, uh, the, the using the process and how the image, they are structured, how the debates is structured around this type of, of evidence. And uh, finally, uh, how we decided to work with uh, legal decisions, and now our legal decisions are decisions written. Uh, how are the texts from uh, these uh, legal decisions allow comprehension 
the using uh, video images in the Brazilian legal system. And this is how we built this, uh, the, the, the line of our research. And an important, uh, important factor that we have to highlight is the, with the, the advance of the, you know, this electronic legal system, uh, how can we have these, uh, who can have this final verdicts through the internet? And uh, therefore these, uh, these, uh, these decisions that we're able to obtain are from the second uh, legal level. We, in Brazil, we have the the federal justice in in Brazil, which is connected to the to the state, to the the country, the union, and we have the state justice that deal with most of the civil and uh, and uh, penal uh, penal legal codes. Most types of crimes are judged by the the state justice. So the data bank that is available is our data banks that uh, from the decisions and uh, and also from the from the state uh, courts. So uh, from the follow from we start from the question that is how can the uh, judicial sentence reveal this uh, cultural repertoire of legal prof professionals in the treatment of image in the judicial context. So this is the research that uh, has motivated us. And at first we start to, to raise some um, legal sentences that involve the image of, uh, of, uh, of legal courts in Sao Paulo, the, the biggest and the, the most popular uh, uh, from in, the, in Brazil, also Minas Gerais, the second, mo the second biggest state in terms of population in Brazil, and then Rio de Janeiro. And we started working with these uh, three uh, court systems, the state court systems in Brazil, and, uh, and considering and uh, raising and, uh, the, all these uh, data and effects and, uh, with, uh, with uh, words and videos and images, we... Uh, we were able to, to collect a great number of uh, legal uh, sentences. And in many cases, uh, those uh, sentences were, were definite. And, uh, and then, you know, of course, you know, we, 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 we took the ones that were uh, definite, you know, separating those deaths. And then we had took all the variables and then we did the, the reading of, uh, of all of these uh, you know, uh, legal decisions, and we had uh, 250 legal uh, decisions. And uh, and what we know, what we observed at the first is that uh, we wanted to know if the judges were watching the videos in the first instance, or they were, or in, in the second. And then uh, we wanted to know if there was a debate about the content that they were seeing in the video. Just a just a, a moment here. Uh, this debate uh, on the content of the video in the decisions, if there were dis there was any type of discussion about the video, and when we started to see the de the decisions uh, of uh, these uh, of these second degree judges, we were shocked because these judges did not watch the videos. Uh, in the, the first uh, degree of a uh, jurisdiction, only four percent of the judges watch the videos. And, uh, and, and in the second uh, level of jurisdiction, and then only around 7% of the legal decisions, there was a mention to the fact that of, uh, of a second level judge have seen this, uh, these videos. So uh, what happens is that these videos was transformed in a, in a written document. And when you take the mode in which the transcription is done, it's completely different from the transcription of Jeff, of Jeff uh, putting his uh, in his studies. And basically, this transcription is a little transcription of what is happening in that content. The image is transformed in uh, written words. It, in, in this way. In this sense, we try to understand how they see the image. Because if we observe the image in video, right, it's, uh, it's not so objective. It is not uh, a portrait of reality. The meaning of the image is not totally obvious. Right, so uh, there are ambiguities, maybe. And what Susan Silva says as well, the images transform the audience in a type of witness so 
we started working with those transcripts and those tests from the census where there was some kind of relation to the fact that the judge had probably watched the video or had ma made comments on the video. So when we uh, we go through the decisions, the text of the decisions, uh, rarely uh, they mention the images. And in many cases, the image is used as an element, indirect element to to settle any uh, legal matter. So for instance, if, if we verify the video that uh, was recently shown now, and that probably, that probably became like a, a, a lawsuit regarding police force, police abuse. So uh, it's, it's very likely that that video has not been watched in the first uh, level of jur jurisdiction or level. So uh, they only transcribe it and they incorporate it into the report of the main judge who will uh, rule in the first level or second level of jurisdiction. Uh, in, a sec in a second level jurisdiction, it's normally like three judges that make a decision uh, as opposed to the first level jurisdiction where you have one judge. So we noticed that besides having a growing uh, a presence of videos in, uh, in the daily routine of uh, the courts in Brazil, this image, it is rarely resorted to, really worked upon. And when it is worked on in a more detailed, thorough way, it is either uh, done directly or transformed into a transcript. Uh, can you please play the video or play past the slide? And in this sense, we try to understand uh, the, the legal culture in Brazil and this became recurrent throughout this whole analysis of all these transcripts and these sentences. Uh, the image is transformed into a to written document, uh, uh, both in civil or criminal cases. And the image is rarely submitted to a verbal debate. So this is a, a great problem in the, the judicial uh, culture in Brazil. So we would rarely discuss that video which has been uh, collected as evidence. So who probably used the video as a counter surveillance instrument uh, to try to oppose to a possible, uh, possible uh, instance of uh, police abuse? He would probably be disappointed because in, uh, the, the judges, they would probably not watch the video. Uh, maybe uh, the assistant would watch the video and transcribe the video. Why is that so? Because uh, according to the Brazilian law, uh, right, the lawsuits, both civil and criminal, uh, the judges are not uh, compelled to watch videos. So it's a system of free will on the end of the, ju the judge, on behalf of the judge. So uh, he can decide what he will value most or less throughout the process. Uh, please uh, pass the slide. So in, in this case here, in this paper, this is already a great advance actually uh, from our database. Uh, these are cases that we extracted from the court of the state of Minas Gerais. Doing the research on the website, right? We came, came up with 400 rulings that somehow uh, the term evidence and video came came up and so we filtered uh, these rulings to find out in what situ which situations uh, a video was actually analyzed and in which uh, circumstances so after uh, 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 after going through this data of 430 rulings this number came down to 160 rulings so uh, the research team she made a thorough uh, research throughout these rulings, uh, and and on, we only found 21 cases uh, with, with some concrete evidence where the video footage have actually been watched by the judges. For, so from 14 to 13 cases that we uh, brought up first, only 21 had an explicit reference to the fact that the judge 
actually watched the video and uh, discussed uh, that content. And in uh, these 21 rulings, in none of these 21 rulings, we can find a reference to the fact that, of, that the video had been presented in the trial session. Because in the second degree of jurisdiction, we have uh, uh, three judges and the main judge shows its report and the other two judges, they just, they either follow or not uh, their report of the main judge. So what we have is right in the second degree of jurisdiction, we have the judges working as they have always worked throughout their careers, right? Working with the uh, written text. And what we notice that in very few cases, the image is analyzed or reproduced and even less debated. Uh, please pass this, pass the slide. So then uh, we found some uh, criteria to uh, in case of uh, the, the sampling, uh, for example, uh, if there was uh, in the text and in the according uh, the, the description of the image uh, where people were being uh, uh, exhibited in these uh, in these uh, in these registrations or any any type of evidence besides the the video that had been reported to the criminal fact and. Uh, the the crime or its circumstances uh, with uh, using the, the the video and also uh, physical characteristics of the suspects who uh, who was uh, you know uh, registered using the video. So here are some uh, then uh, some uh, excerpts of uh, of two uh, rulings. For example, uh, we see here, uh, fi fi finally, uh, this should be you know, noted that, uh, that uh, uh, in spite of the video that had been uh, collected as it was possible to see the, the accuser by his peculiar way of walking. Uh, and the contact that he had with the with the judge during the instruction, and then and, uh, and during the ruling, considering what was said by the police that he had a, a very unique way of walking when analyzing the the images uh, according to the safety cameras, uh, the the CD. It's this is together with uh, in the part of the process that he had left the establishment, she had a different way of walking and can be and could be recognized by the people who was in contact with him, as is the case of the policemen who arrested him and in other cases of uh, property of crime and the quality of the image of this is of this type. So what we observe is that in many cases, the argument of the video, it is in, it is embedded in a direct way that that is uh, the argument that it's possible to obtain with the video is uh, it is a uh, sought uh, with the other elements that will base the decision of the judge as is the as is the the statement from the policeman and sometimes the, this uh, statement Philippine has a much bigger weight than the image themselves and or sometimes the the and the, the way uh, concerning the way that the policeman uh, describes the the image in the video moving on uh, please. So in this other appeal, uh, the case, we, there is no doubt that Danielle was recognized by the victims as, or, or the stand, stand buyers as a criminal of a theft. And, uh, in, and if he is or not the person who appears in the video uh, reproduced in the DVD together with the pay, page 208 from this, uh, from this, uh, lawsuit process. So this part of the, we see here a, 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 tend, a tendency to, uh, to, to, embed, uh, to direct uh, incorporation of the video in the process of, of uh, in the ruling. 
So in case of uh, of these uh, of these decisions from the from the text that we have worked with, we observe that the image is accompanied by other types of uh, evidence, such as testimonials from the victims or police officers. The indirect analysis of the video prevails in context marked by the by uh, written procedures. So there is no uh, there is no oral debate uh, around the the type of uh, of of evidence means that involves a, a technical means that involves a bigger complexity, and also that uh, involves in uh, a uh, an inspector or an expert to uh, to be part of this uh, decision making, and also the fact that the debate over the image does not uh, it's not very sophisticated. It, it doesn't work with uh, with a deeper uh, features of the, the video. It doesn't take into account the possibility of the image uh, suffering some uh, some types of interruption of the image uh, being uh, a, a cut. You know, a, a sample of a perfect example of the reality. It's not a, a perfect picture of uh, almost. Uh, uh, it's it's a uh, non-negotiable of what is really seen, you know, and uh, and the image having this uh, characteristic. And another important factor is that uh, there is a need uh, in, at this stage to improve what many authors like uh, of uh, the visual literacy of uh, professionals in uh, of law in Brazil. This work that we are developing uh, over eight years is a uh, is a work that is so much focused on the on the text of the of the ruling of the sentences and uh, and we are working uh, some pro working some professionals from the legal area, uh, judges, uh, promoters, and uh, lawyers, assistants. Uh, it's a student from a master degree student. She is working on. Uh, student of mine, and we are interviewing uh, these uh, legal professionals to to understand what they do and how they receive uh, an evidence based from a uh, from a video in, from a video, and how do they see the videos when they see an evidence as a video? How do they uh, how do they take decisions to validate or not validate that content? And uh, the, the first dive into this uh, this theme, uh, we observe that uh, the image is uh, is, uh, is is still used in a way very shy and uh, in the Brazilian courts, and this is interesting because uh, our if we observe uh, the characteristics of the Brazilian society, the Brazilian society it is uh, in the power of the image. The, the register image of in video or the TV image, it is a, a sent, it is a core. It participates in the in the the daily interactions of people uh, in the internet, the consumption of internet of uh, social networks or of, uh, social media, the use of apps and you know, of uh, exchange message videos and so on is very high compared to several other uh, countries in the world. But when we we reach the legal sphere, we we uh, we observe that the, the legal apparatus is still deals with the image as a legal as a written document and as a, a civil code even says that 2002 says that that you can use the image but it is a document but you don't have a legal treatment but uh, but but a little bit more sophisticated to take consideration its characteristic its uh, potentials its problems. So, uh, so this is still, as we can observe, a uh, a, a, a specific uh, way to see the, to, to to debate this as a this the video as a legal context. So, this is what I'd like to talk in summary. So, then we can be open for debates. There's a lot of interesting information here, and I also like to thank uh, Foundation of Research of the State of Minas Gerais. That which has been uh, funding this research, it has funded the first the work of in twenty from twenty thirteen to twenty sixteen, and now also it finances uh, uh, the 
continuation of our research. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent, for your uh, presentation. It's really interesting, right, to think how the uh, court system in Brazil, the legal system in Brazil, deals with this uh, evidence and uh, how this contrast is so different uh, compared to what happens in the United States, right? We've been used to seeing uh, uh, in the literature as well as in, in the media, right? How the uh, Brazilian judicial system, how it deals with this uh, in a, such a different way regarding uh, video footage. So uh, we've finished all these three presentations. So I'd like to ask, well, I believe that all the guests are have their cams on already. So right now, I, I believe we can uh, move on to the debate, right? Uh, in our panel, we have about 30, 35 minutes for debate. And then I already have some questions, which have been posted by the audience. So I will have a round of questions addressed to each one of you. And then we will uh, move on, right? First Jeffrey in the sequence, and then we move on to Amanda and then Vincent. Okay, so I'll just uh, select and arrange the questions here and I'll hand them over to you just a minute. Well, first question we have, it, it was in English, so let me change the channel here. Uh, the first question uh, is for uh, Jeff. The question is, how did you construct the hypothesis te testing? What kind of model and test is statistic? And what variables did you use to construct mm -hmm. the linguistic regression model? Uh, that's a question from João Pedro Valadares Padua. Uh, just gonna check. I'm just gonna change the the channel again to Portuguese. Just one second. É uma questão para para Amanda. So uh, then we have a question for Amanda. Amanda, this is uh, also a question for Jeffrey. So as researchers, there is a debate if we should uh, ask ourselves if it's ethical or not to uh, analyze videos in extreme cases, such as what we've had uh, pretty often in the United States and Brazil. And how do these analysis in these extreme cases, for instance, a uh, murder, homicide, or uh, other violent cases, how do these analysis uh, made by researchers, how can they influence in the discourse of these cases as well as uh, police violence in a more uh, broader way? Uh, that would be the question to both of you. And to Vincent, let me see just a minute. Are there, is there data or evidence regarding the uh, preference for written methods to demand for demanding less time to process the information. Uh, in other words, is reading easier than watching videos? That would be a question for you, Vincent. So I believe we can um, uh, move to the first round, and then I believe we have uh, more questions, and then we'll go to the second round. So uh, I'll hand up the word to Jeff, and then we move on to Amanda and Vincent. Uh, thank, thank you very much for the question, uh, and I'm going to probably speak to it in, in a less comprehensive way than um, one might have hoped, but uh, uh, I'm mostly a qualitative analyst uh, and I, can tr uh, I collaborated with a, a quantitative specialist, Kristen Prakota, in working through uh, how to um, develop these analyses. So I'm, I'm probably not the person to ask about how we did the, uh, the, the modeling. Uh, but I can give you a brief overview of the method we used. Um, so we first began just doing analysis of individual cases, began to identify distinctive practices, describe to how those practices work and how they matter. Uh, and on the basis of that, we began to develop um, a method for um, uh, uh, doing some kind of quantitative analysis. So we had uh, multiple uh, researchers code 
the data. Uh, and so I'm showing you, you know, uh, the sort of precision and recall measures. So we had some level, a uh, uh, pretty strong level of uh, intercoder reliability. Uh, this is the sort of number. We, we coded a subset of the encounters. We have about five to 700 encounters. We took 37, 37 of them that were randomly selected. Uh, and you can see the numbers of, of uh, individual phenomena here that we uh, are coded. And then to develop the, uh, the hypotheses, um, uh, you know, there was a, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out uh, the most precise or best way to describe the, the question we're trying to test. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned in this first one, we're, we're trying to find this tight connection um, and what, what you see here is the, the raw numbers of, of how these uh, worked out. Uh, and so when we're talking about odds, we're, oops, when we're talking about odds, uh, we're talking about the log odds. Uh, so uh, it's a standard uh, statistical procedure. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, uh, but that's, that's sort of the background uh, on this. And um, if you have a, a, a more specific question, I'd be happy to talk with you uh, online, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm certainly not the person who should be offering advice on how to do quantitative analyses. This is why collaboration is so important. Uh, so thank you very much for the question. I'd be glad to talk about anything else, but I'm gonna turn it over to Amanda to, talk, uh, uh, to address that next question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Amanda? Well, I'll, I'll hand a word uh, to Professor Maria de Carmen so she can share a little bit more about this matter of ethics. Well, the matter of ethics, she it's, it is all, nowadays, it's a, a, a relevant data for any type of data. Right? The problem is that if we have a goal, if we aim to make police officers develop a better capacity of reflection and uh, be self-critical -crit about the actions that he performs uh, automatically, right? And unconsciously, let's say, if you use a in in a, an approach that we cannot even uh, show in detail here, but a multimodal approach, it becomes clearer uh, the actions even of the body because if. If you notice the bodies, you'll see that each of those uh, video footage scenes, they had like a, a look, you know, the steps forward or backward. I mean, there are movements where you, 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 can't, you cannot erase the face if you don't observe his face, his eyes, his arms. You know, what we could do uh, probably would be like to limit this, these type of videos to transcriptions. But in the case of projections, projecting the video in formation courses is what we've done in a workshop here in Rio de Janeiro. We gather some police officers to watch videos and say what they thought about it, about their uh, uh, the police actions. And even like uh, put ourselves in their own shoes to understand why they thought that resistance uh, justified uh, neck choke, right? When uh, police, uh, nor when there were no uh, apparent situations to use that kind of force. And this is a point that, you know, it, it has to be shown on the video. There's no way to not show that in the video. And the multimodal, this is perfect for that. Now, when we move on to a presentation uh, in, uh, in a, at an article, for instance, then, you know, we count on the cooperation of the reader uh, observing the multimodal transcriptions and the verbal language so he can uh, notice what's actually going on. So I believe we can think on the limit, it's what we do, of projections of such videos uh, to, the, uh, to the police officers, restricting these videos to the police officers. But on the other hand, if we think that uh, such videos were not uh, uh, recorded spontaneously, you know, they were, they were uh, uploaded on the internet by a civilian, and they are there, there are many of them, right? There's even one that we, we really feel like uh, uh, presenting. And it's totally related to the Victor's uh, case because he, he goes on trial and it went on the internet, it became a media. And then what does a judge rule on, right? The, the absurd of those actions and racism uh, on behalf of the police officer that didn't question anything, didn't justify anything. He just can't handcuff the man just because he was a black man. You know, and then this video was on YouTube. 
So what happened? The judge said, no, the police officer acted uh, uh, accordingly. So even if the image, when people do not want to see what's uh, on the image, how can we work with data that is not allowed, where, where video footage is not allowed? If they are in the internet, if they are in the news, you know, I, I asked myself, uh, how far uh, under such conditions can we actually uh, uh, give in images which are public in a most radical way because the internet is for all in the whole world? Yeah, thank you very much, Karma, uh, Maria Ducamos. Just uh, to introduce her, Professor Maria Ducamos, she's a co author of this uh, work with Amanda Velasco. And uh, I'll hand the word to Vincent to answer the question. Thank you. Well, regarding uh, the, the cultural factor, the legal culture, because we've been working here with culture as a monolith, you know, and it's absolutely linked to action as well. So we have to take this into account. But when I, when we observe, when we say here that we have a tendency in transforming oral, verbal into written, this is something that is, you know, uh, recognized by the literature for a long time. Right, the literature that analyzes the way that the legal system works in Brazil. And we can also notice empirically uh, through our uh, database of texts here. Well, first of all, they don't watch videos. Second, when there is a reference to the video, there's always a transcription of the content from this video. And the major issue is that this transcription is not a transcription that should follow follow uh, forensics linguistics, but it's a literal transcription. So it's useless. This transcription is useless. And there is also uh, much debate in prosecutors in Brazil and so sociologists regarding the difficulty in effectively and effectivating the verbal matter. So this process, both in criminal and civil, they've been like too attached to format in Brazil, mainly the written format. So something has changed uh, as in the civil code, but we still must know how these uh, legal professionals, they, they've been operating these new forms. So this is what we've been trying to do right now in the second uh, work with the people who, who, uh, act in the legal department here in the city of Juju Fora to understand how they react to the presence of video footage on a daily routine uh, and rather than focusing more on text. So from this point on, we will be probably be able to answer your questions. And I believe we will be able to understand the reason why the reason for this scenario, I'll give you an interesting example here. I have a student, uh, a master's uh, uh, student. He's a military judge, and he had a, a very interesting uh, final paper regarding uh, a lawsuit that started with a video in, right, uh, that had an assault in within a military headquarter in Juiz Fada, and it reached uh, the military court in the city of Brasilia, which is the highest court, military court in Brazil. And in this lawsuit, they analyzed the arguments used by uh, the prosecutor, by the, the uh, defender, by the judge, by the military judges as well. And it's really interesting how they work. But I mean, the first, uh, uh, the first piece that they receive is like the, right? Right. The, fir the first thing they have in the lawsuit is a literal transcription of the video, and they and they they always mention the arguments toward against what has been transcribed. Uh, when the military uh, the military justice the, their procedure has a characteristic a characteristic where it works as a jury. So it has more uh, verbal power because they have like uh, four military judges against 
one, uh, uh, in theory, at least a civil judge. So there's, uh, there's all this debate going on, but yet all the documents in the lawsuit uh, work with a transcription. So this is a recurring factor in uh, lawsuits and pra uh, judicial practice in Brazil. And so when we look at images, we see uh, lots of transcriptions. And I wonder, uh, does anybody have all that patience, you know, to read all that? No, really. They can't even uh, watch a video. I mean, like, uh, I can't imagine them reading all that transcribed material. But this is a recurring event in uh, legal practice in Brazil. So this is the second step in the research that we've been trying to understand how these uh, uh, uh How, how these legal operators, how they receive the images, the video footages, and they try to incorporate that video footage in their uh, uh, strategies in their daily routine. But this is a, a very uh, common trait of our uh, legal culture. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but... Thank you, Vincent. I will hand the word to, once again, to Jeffrey, if you could make a comment regarding the ethics and the video uh, regarding violence, police violence in the videos. Jeffrey. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving me a time to address the question. Uh, I also want to just say that I endorse uh, everything Professor DeCarmo uh, and Dr. DiNucci have said about why they looked at violence directly. I think it's important. Um, I, I only wanted to add two things. One, I think Uh, Professor Riccio's analysis of what happens to videos in legal encounters is a really great example of why we need the video and not some other kind of evidence. When we lose the actual unfolding events and images as they happen, we have a really different understanding of what happens uh, uh, in, in those encounters that we're trying to understand. Uh, and the second thing I'll mention, uh, and, and Uh, this is why my colleague Kevin Whitehead is, I think, here and, and, and Brett Bowman. Uh, we have, the three of us have a, a collaborative project to try and understand uh, routine violence in everyday encounters. And uh, we start with an observation made uh, by a violence researcher some time back that the vast majority of research on violence never looks at actual violence. Uh, And it's very hard to understand the, uh, an aspect of the human experience if we don't ever look at the actual thing that it's uh, that, that as it's composed and, and realized in our lives and in the lives of the people who it affects. Um, and just to then echo something uh, Professor DeCarmo said, uh, a lot of times the videos we're analyzing were produced by people in neighborhoods that are subject to systematic police scrutiny and, and violence. Uh, and they produce those videos to make it a, 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 the, their experiences available to others. They present them to us as researchers precisely because they feel they're not being seen and understood. Uh, and I think we have an obligation in that case to understand the experiences of people subject to these kinds of uh, living conditions. Uh, and so showing them is not, uh, not a, a, an ethical violation, it's an ethical obligation. Uh, and I think so long as we approach them with a seriousness and a care and concern about the lives of the participants involved, uh, I think it's, it's an ethical thing to do. Um, and so it's not, you know, should we or shouldn't we, it's how should we. And, uh, and I think that's a matter that is worthy of uh, consideration and debate. So I just uh, wanted to add that, that little bit on it. Muito obrigado, Jeff. Uh, Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Vamos continuar, então. So we will carry on with... Well, another, another round of questions. One question first to Vincent. Riccio, Riccio. Vincent, could you uh, point out actually the fact of observing uh, very few decisions that cite video footage as evidence, even uh, with all these cameras being used in society? It's a question from Alexandre Souza. Also, a question to Amanda and Jeffrey as well. Uh, many people are, uh, 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 make accountable. They, uh, the police conduct and the racial which is uh, acquired within the police training in case of brazil for instance the military training is it uh, uh utopic to think of a humanized police force it's a question from uh, mrs marie 
Well, I hand a question to Vincent first, and then I'll hand it over to Jeffrey and Amanda. Well, I believe that if if we think of well, the ubiquity of the videos is a fact, but as I mentioned a little before, uh, the Brazilian society it it is extremely uh, mediatic in all aspects. And uh, for long, right? So with the advance of the internet and social media, with smartphones, uh, with its capacity to uh, register all these images, uh, re regardless of time and space, this is obviously present. But when we chose uh, the ruling as our the sentence, the judicial sentence as our uh, topic of research, which, which it reaffirms through the written word. What is interesting is that we find these references. Through videos, but the text of the sentences. It does not allow for a uh, more thorough analysis of cases where the video is present as evidence. So, uh, of, of course, it has caused some kind of perplexity towards our, on ourselves that in very few cases, such documents, written documents, actually uh, uh, had argu argumented regarding those images. So this has led us to reflect uh, upon what which cultural elements in our uh, judicial practice could actually interfere in a better usage or not of video footage as evidence. So I believe that your this conclusion, right, and and this uh, uh, path to research it, it comes up according to our confrontation and to empirical material that we come up with, which is uh, the rulings from secondary jurisdictions. Even though the search engines on the internet, you have the video, this video, that evidence, mobile phone, for instance. When we seek to extract from that content a, a more sophisticated perspective, of a video as an evidence, you know, uh, there are very, very, very few, few cases where uh, decisions make direct uh, mentioning to the videos. So this is probably the great question that we have on behalf of researchers trying to understand how the professional incorporates the video, when they incorporate it, how they incorporate it in the decision making process or as arguments. Uh, then trying to understand uh, exclusively uh, the text of the decision. Okay, thank you, Vincent. I will hand the word to Amanda and also to, to Professor Maria de Carmo if she would like to make comments as well, the question that has been addressed to them. Yeah, we do have to think of police training for sure when we talk about these uh, uh, decision-making process in uh, these uh, approaches with the civilians. And it's a really good question. I believe it's important to actually think about how this training could uh, take place and how our studies can contribute to that, right? How can we uh, use our researchers, researches to have a effective contribution to change in our society? And what we notice you probably, uh, you've seen a video here that lasts three minutes, but even in three minutes, you know, there are many matters that emerge. Uh, we see that this scenario is so complex. Uh, to actually uh, try to understand everything, we have also like uh, uh, carried out field research, interviewed uh, community dwellers, police officers, high rank police officers, and police officers in, on the streets and the communities and the front line. And uh, even the police officers themselves, they pointed out in the interviews the need for a different type of training, the need for a more practical uh, training, more contextualized training, because most of them say that the decision that they take uh, on a daily basis is uh, 
total, very related to to their own beliefs. Uh, many of them uh, um, say that their decisions are also linked to their character, and very few like uh, link their decisions. Very few link their decisions to an effective training. So uh, I believe that we do have to, uh, you know, increase this movement in contributing gradually, uh, uh, more, more increasingly more to a an effective training, and also the analysis of videos is a tool that is really interesting to develop this. So I will ask uh, Professor Maria Dukama to talk a little more about it. We have actually uh, uh, carried out these workshops, so um, Professor Carmo can talk more about it. Uh, your mic is off. Excuse me. So, yeah, the question was if part of the question regarding training was if it was the topic to think of a, a, a more hum, humanistic uh, police practice, right? We've been seeing this in the field of medicine. You have to be more uh, humane, right? In the police of, police force, we have uh, the, uh, an issue, which is the culture, the police culture, which in Brazil, people think that people will follow the law if they, they are punished in a violent way. And this really just harms uh, uh, having a humane police force. But I'd like to uh, also like add to it because I carried out an experience uh, through through lectures in, in a police prison in the, st in the state of Rio de Janeiro, not in the city, okay, within the city. But it was a military police and it's, it's a prison for pol military police officers. And what surprised me is because we had like a, uh, book reading sessions and we had some kind of debate. They had, they answered questions. And what surprised me is how some police officers were so touched with this lecture. And in the end, they would tell me today, reflecting upon what brought me here. because I killed a person. I see that I would have done it differently. I hadn't seen that in that moment, in the heat of the moment. So I, I, I can, I tell people that I've, I've met the good and the bad side of police officers. And what I see in those group of prisoners is that there is a group which actually needed to hear things and see things to think of change. And others probably have no way out, maybe uh, someday, eventually. But my experience, I'd like to add to this, my experience was really uh, uh, gratifying, rewarding. I loved lecturing in the uh, uh, prison for military police officers because I I've noticed a great change in many of them. So I believe it's not a topic, if, uh, despite uh, the culture in Brazil, which is still uh, uh, where everybody claims for a need to, uh, to be reformed, but it hasn't been reformed yet. So this extensive patrol, everybody's an enemy and everybody will probably uh, apply violence, which is not expected to be applied against humans, right? But there is a humane side on every police officer and maybe this is the way where we can uh, perform change. Yeah, uh, uh, and, and regarding the police officers who are uh, still on patrol and on the streets, or you can think of a way to prevent this, right? Yeah, one, one, one interesting thing that touched me is that those who, those who are arrested are in prison now, they will be back on the streets, right? So we do have a chances of, of uh, having a police as, you know, that listens to the other, to the civilians, Right. And but if she simply if she simply acts, there's no other way. Of course, there will be resistance. Thank you, Professor Carmen and Amanda. I'll hand the word now to Jeffrey to uh, comment on this question as well. Thank you very much. I, I, uh, I think it's a really important question. Uh, and I, I, I believe it's an open question whether or not police uh, organizations can reform. I think it's a it's a very serious question. Uh, I, just in hearing uh, Professor DeCarmo and, and uh, Danucci talk about this, uh, it, 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 I'm struck by the similarities between what we see in, in American policing. So Nikki Jones and I and some colleagues have a paper coming out in city and community where we document um, how differential re uh, policing practices uh, in, in different neighborhoods lead to highly racialized difference in the ways police conduct encounters. Uh, and one of the observations <clears throat> in, in this paper is that it's not just that they happen to police differently in these neighborhoods, it's that they believe not policing differently is incompetent. 
that uh, that they're required to police in this way, that people won't listen or won't respond if they don't use violence. Uh, and so uh, it, it's it's one thing if you're working with a group of people who um, don't quite understand what they're doing. It's another when uh, uh, the basic uh, there's a basic set of beliefs that incorporates this as a requirement of competent policing. Uh, and I think that makes the challenge much greater. But I would also notice uh, and I think this was reflected in uh, Professor DeCarmo's comments that uh, in, a, in the U.S., um, the, the rate of alcoholism among, among police officers, addiction, depression, mental illness is incredibly high, much higher than the population at large. And that's because the job that they're being asked to do is corrosive to the possibility of living as kind of stable, mentally, uh, mentally healthy life. And so this is uh, something that we need to do to preserve and, and protect communities that is changing policing. Uh, but it's also something that we need to do because police officers uh, uh, are humans and suffer as well. Uh, and I think when they go into policing, they often enter with very altruistic ideas about how they're gonna help communities and find themselves changed over time by the practice of, uh, of policing that they're uh, worked into. And so uh, I don't know whether it's possible for police organizations in their current form to change, but I do know that until there's some viable alternative out there, uh, it's our obligation to provide examples of how they could do it differently and encourage them to work differently. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, if some other alternative uh, uh, vision um, uh, coming out of the abolitionist perspective prevails, then, then wonderful. But until then, I think we still have work to do. Muito obrigado, Geoff. Uh, Thank you, Geoff. A gente pode. And I believe we can go for a last round of questions before we close uh, today's panel. So, first, a question to Vincent. Vincent, uh, in your presentation, one of the conclusions drawn is that it's necessary to have improvements in uh, in the visual perspective of judges. How can this be done and what would be the consequences of such process of improvement of, of improving their perception? And one more question as well for Jeffrey regarding uh, access to such data, police data. Uh, police is known as a black box, right? Accessing police data normally is quite difficult. So I'd like to know, I'd like you to talk a little bit of how this access to such data, how it occurred and the obstacles, the challenges. So how did you uh, experience this access to police data? So uh, first I'll hand the word to Vincent for his question. Well, uh, the concept of visual visual uh, literacy for judges regarding text, right? Uh, it moves towards the idea that if if we do not want only judges but all prof legal professionals, right? If if we demand that they uh, assess images. Evaluate images with more uh, criticality and avoid errors in the use of images. Then it is necessary that we have programs to be developed so they can understand the images. So there are suggestions that move uh, from uh, uh, courses and understanding images, right? Legal courses uh, into specific uh, programs for these professionals be them uh, attorneys, judges, police officers, so they can use video footage as uh, with, with more efficacy, with more uh, accuracy to avoid errors, mainly uh, decision-taking errors regarding the usage of these images. Because there's a case, for instance, uh, a renowned case in the Supreme Court in the United States that's cited by all the authors where right, the, the judge, uh, upon analyzing a pursuit, he said, this video is more exciting than Operation France. 
right? Comparing the video uh, with Operation France, you know, this is highly criticized mainly because the video was just an extract, but there, it, it had, uh, you know, only one, there was only one vote who actually pointed out failures in the way the videos were being considered and also other elements beyond the first observation of the video footage of the police pursuit. So I believe this would be really important to try to develop other protocols and uh, in the use of video footages, uh, develop standards uh, for the use of videos in a legal context. So I believe that all this is part of uh, w what we call uh, visual literacy. Thank you, Vincent. I'll hand a word to Jeffrey once again. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, it, there's a bit of a story about how we got access to this data. It was uh, associated with a project that was funded by the government, uh, and they, the funding agency, entered into a memorandum uh, of understanding with two different police departments, one that gave us access to their dash-mounted camera, and then another that allowed us to hire video researchers to ride along with police officers and videotape everything they did and interview them as they did it. So that's how we got our original data, uh, which was uh, some time ago. I won't, uh, it's embarrassing how long uh, we've had the data and how long it's taken me to come to grips with it. But what I would say is I think there's a real sea change underway, especially in the United States context. Uh, I'm gonna share a, 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 a a hyperlink with uh, everyone on the, the Zoom chat. And I don't know if it can be shared on the um, YouTube channel, but uh, many policing agencies are now publishing uh, extensive video records of especially critical incidents. Uh, and I've posted one from Walnut Creek uh, that had an officer involved shooting and they published uh, everything, uh, the, the multiple camera angles as well as aspects of uh, the uh, how they got the video, they interviewed the police officers, the videos of the police officers being interviewed are available, the medical records. Uh, they're really providing comprehensive public documentation of what they did, what happened on the day and what they did in the aftermath of that. And I think more police departments are heading in that direction. And so there will be, and, and are increasingly are much more uh, publicly available data. Um, a second thing I'll mention is um, there are a range of YouTube channels where police department videos are posted either for a specific department or when critical incidents come up. Uh, I think these are useful and interesting. They're important to study, but we can't lose sight of the fact that these are mostly filmed from the perspective of the police uh, and are often uh, uh, produced and, and, and provided to justify police actions. And so I think the other thing we can do is make sure that we gather data from communities that are subject to this kind of policing because the major trove that really a data trove that got me started working with police was uh, from a guy named Ray Washington who uh, lived in San Francisco and he took it on as a job to record the police every time they came into the neighborhood and so my colleague Nikki Jones met him and he had uh, literally bags and bags full of video of uh, his encounters with police officers whenever they came into the neighborhood. And so I think community level perspective video on policing is also important. Uh, and, and so I think, uh, you know, the work that Dr. Danucci and Professor DeCarmo are doing reveals how useful that can be to have community uh, 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 video available to inform how we understand um, this. So uh, I was lucky uh, to get access to some, some departmental video early on, but I haven't relied on that much since then. And mostly I'm using publicly available data. Uh, and I think that's a direction most researchers can take. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, well, unfortunately, our time is nearly up. So if I could, you know, I would spend more time with you talking with all of you. I'm sure there are other questions that uh, many people like to make, but before uh, uh, concluding, I'd just like to uh, thank, th thank uh, on behalf of myself, on behalf of my coworkers and, and Cecilia, which is uh, the co-organizer of this event. So first of all, I'd like to thank all of those who have been present watching these panels throughout these three weeks. 
and also thank uh, uh, the guests, uh, mainly the guests of today, uh, Jeffrey Raymond, a man of Velasco, and uh, Vincent Riccio, and also uh, Professor Maria Ducarmo, Oliveria, and Kevin Whiteman, who are here with us today for having accepted uh, this invite and uh, for enriching all these panels. I am sure that the presentations, your presentations will inspire other researchers, students, and professionals for public security, uh, the, whether it's in Brazil or in England. So I also like to uh, thank Navi, uh, the Nucleus of uh, Studies for Violence and the British Academy at the School of Arts London. The British Academy actually enabled all these series of events. So our special thanks also to the interpreters, Fabio and Zach. And a uh, uh, final thank to two players here uh, without whom these, this event would never have happened. Uh, and we're really grateful for them, Alessa Katani and Christina Ushoa. So our uh, great thanks to you. And so I end our list of webinars now and like to wish you all a very good night or good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much for being here.